This meeting is being recorded. Oh boy. I think I know all of you all. James, I'm Joe. Nice to nice Joe. to meet you. Yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you. This is a well-rounded panel. I feel like we could have like three hours. No. <laughs> Not cover most of it. Danny, you guys haven't done any other uh, panel discussions yet this week, right? No, this is the first one. Um, we did a lunch and learn yesterday with a panel discussion on the Our Big Sky plan. Right, right. How'd that go? It's great. Yeah, nice. Yeah, you guys packed a lot in this week. I'm, it's impressive. Nice work. It's exhaustive. Yeah, for sure, man. No, it's all good. I think we, after this year, hopefully we'll have it honed in on like, okay, this is the, the right recipe mm -hmm. for what we're looking for. Sure. I think it was smart to join forces with the chamber rather than try to do two. That was Oh, cool. for sure. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do is just make it more clearly delineated. And, mm -hmm. um, make sure that we're not being duplicative. Mm -hmm. These moments always make me think of Anchorman. <laughs> the arsonist had oddly shaped feet. <laughs> Unique New York. All right, we'll go live in a minute. <clears throat> So James, yeah, we're going to start with you, just sort of an overview of the Big Sky water supply and the situation, if that works. Sure. Yeah. Great. All right, it's high noon. We're gonna go ahead and get kicked off here. Um, good afternoon, Big Sky. My name is Danny Bierschwal. I'm the executive director with the Big Sky Resort Area District. And we're so proud to be working with this wonderful community to, to host a suite of events here that um, we are now in our second day of. Um, yesterday, we heard from our community leaders, um, many community leaders regarding the implementation of the Our Big Sky plan. And in the evening, we heard from our officials who are candidates moving forward for the November election. Both of those sessions are now available online. So if you missed them, go back and, and catch them in the virtual realm. 
Um, we're really excited about this discussion today, and our, our topic today is water supply. So focused on, you know, the big ideas and, and concepts that are critical to the success of our community. And um, we look forward to this discussion today, and it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator. He's a neighbor, friend, and uh, member of the Big Sky family right here with us, Joe O'Connor. Um, Joe has done a few of these moderated discussions as we um, were in the midst of a pandemic here in Big Sky, and, and there was a need for uh, helping to to get the word out regarding what Big Sky and the community at large is, is working on regarding uh, the pandemic. And I cannot think of a better moderator than uh, our uh, neighbor, Joe O'Connor here. So without further ado, Joe, thanks for joining us and, and moderating this discussion. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, oh, and congratulations yeah. on your new role as managing editor with Mountain Outlaw. Um, I'm sure you will be as successful with them as you were here in our community with Outlaw Partners. So thank you, Joe. Thank you, Danny. Uh, welcome everyone and uh, happy lunch, lunchtime. I, I don't know, what do you say at noon? I guess <laughs> good day could work, but um, anyway, thank you for joining us for this community week panel discussion on water supply. Uh, and thank you again, Danny, for the introduction. Um, again, I'm Joe O'Connor, Managing Editor for Mountain Journal, a nonprofit public interest conservation journalism site dedicated to saving the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, our stories are free online at mountainjournal.org. Little plug there. Uh, as Danny mentioned, you know, I've lived in Big Sky most of the last uh, 10 years, and as a journalist, I've been covering issues like water supply and many others here over that time. Um, Water in the American West might be the most important issue we face. It's connected to nearly every other component of life in this area of the country, wildfire, drought, population density, housing development, wildlife, recreation. In Southwest Montana and in Big Sky in particular, it dominates local headlines and has been the source, so to speak, uh, of concern and debate, but it is our life source. The mighty Gallatin River runs right over there and is a constant reminder of the beauty of this area. And it also reminds us of what we must protect, preserve, and respect. We have a great panel with us today. I'd love to introduce them now. Kristen Gardner is the Chief Executive and Science Officer for the Gallatin River Task Force. Uh, full disclosure, my wife Emily is the organization's Conservation Director. Jim Muscat is water superintendent for the Gallatin Canyon Water and Sewer District. And uh, Scott Altman, who is with us, is not? Uh, is not it, yet. Not yet. We're hoping Scott will join us. He's the board chair. Um, Rich Chandler serves as director of environmental operations for Low Mountain Land Company. Mace Mangold is senior project engineer with WGM Group. Uh, that's a Montana planning and design firm that's helped to solidify uh, the Gallatin Canyon Water and Sewer District as a public utility and advance uh, a key Big Sky community goal of providing, or excuse me, improving and protecting the Gallatin River. And last but not least, James Rose is a hydrologist for the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology. Uh, quickly, want to just put this out there. We only have an hour, so I'd like to remind our panelists to please keep your responses to five minutes or less. Uh, we'll have a short amount of time at the end um, of our discussion for audience questions as well. You can submit these questions via Facebook or Zoom. And finally, a recording of this discussion will be available uh, tomorrow morning on bigskycommunityweek.com. All right, let's get it going. Uh, James, James Rose, I'd like to start with you. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, it'd be great to get an overview of Big Sky's water supply and the current situation here in the area. Yeah, certainly. Uh, thank you for the invite, Joe, and thanks for the panel, uh, and good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to put up a uh, presentation I have, uh, give you the five-minute overview of, or 10-minute overview, I guess, of uh, what uh, we've been working on at Big Sky, and uh, we have a, this extensive report was just published uh, this last this fall and uh, is, is now available for everybody. But I want to give you a little summary of kind of what we found with the investigation of 
of uh, Big Sky's uh, water supply situation. Uh, I work for the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology uh, Groundwater Investigation Program, and our job is to uh, work with local communities with water supply issues, whether it's water quality or water availability. And we try and do the geologic and hydrogeologic background and research to figure out, uh, answer some uh, standard, some questions about what's going on, what's the nature of the uh, water systems that are available to the community and help them with some uh, general information, some uh, interpretation of what's going on with the uh, geology and hydrogeology of the area so that they can make decisions for their future planning and design. And that's exactly what we did at Big Sky. The question at Big Sky was, uh, there's, there's concern in the future that uh, water supply is going to be uh, stressed and, and uh, going to be inadequate for supplying water to the growing community. And so we tried to identify all the water supply systems available and looked into any possible alternative water sources as well. I'd like to point out too that all water supplies that come uh, that are supplied in uh, Big Sky all come from groundwater. That's, there's no surface water use, uh, and that's a permitting issue more than anything. But uh, everything is, at Big Sky comes from groundwater, so it's vitally important to understand what the groundwater system's like. So for this project, uh, we took our groundwater information center database we have here, and we looked at all the wells available in use at Big Sky and tried to identify all the different aquifer systems that are in use within, within the study area, within the Big Sky community. And uh, we wanted to monitor each, each of those aquifers and figure out uh, what the nature of them is, what's, what the water uh, availability might be from those, what the water chemistry is like, uh, is the water quality good? those sort of things. And uh, from that, we selected 94 wells that we monitored for about a year and a half, almost two years to look at water level changes, look at the water chemistry. We also drilled 15 wells in the Meadow Village aquifer, which is right here, down here below the golf course at Meadow Village. And uh, tried to de better define that uh, sand and gravel aquifer. That's a very big part of water supplies at Big Sky. <clears throat> from our investigation work, we found that there were seven aquifers that are in use uh, at Big Sky from various wells. And uh, two of the major ones are sand and gravel beneath the Mountain Village area and sand and gravel beneath the Meadow Village golf course area. And those are big suppliers and the best producers uh, for, the, for the Big Sky area. But outside of those areas, everybody has, in any well supply has to rely on bedrock water sources. And those bedrock sources are come from five different aquifers. And you can see the blue marks are roughly where those are. Uh, it's pretty variable depending on where you are in, in the uh, Big Sky area. But uh, essentially, these are sandstones, thin sandstones, maybe three to 10 feet thick within a thick shale package. Uh, most of the rock is shale, uh, which is very poor uh, conductor of water, uh, very little water moves through it. So you have to rely on these small sandstone uh, lead uh, formations to uh, supply you the water. And you can see of all the uh, bedrock available in about 2,400 feet of geologic section below Big Sky, less than 20% is probably uh, sandstones that can contain water and not all those sandstones do have water in them. So you can see that you've already limit put quite a limit on, on uh, where your water supply might come from. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, this black rock here, this is up at Oozle Falls area. This black rock is a shale. None of this- hey, James, you know, any sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. I think your slides aren't moving with your- Oh, your... okay. Do um, you have one of Oozle Falls here? Uh, just a shale outcrop? I think we're looking at your, your kind of opening oh, page. Covers. Oh, really? Okay. Let me try it again here. Try to share again. Oh, it's paused. Let's see what's going on here. Resume share. Okay. There we go. So there's the wells. Okay. The 94 wells. And then uh, here was the section, the geologic cross section. And uh, showing the blue shows the different aquifers in the bedrock and the two sand and gravel ones up above. And uh, and then uh, this is Oozle Falls. Can you see that, the shale outcrop? Oozle Falls, okay. Uh, so, so the shale formation doesn't carry or transmit water well at all. 
And so there's no water in this thick section of shale, which is predominantly what's at Big Sky. There's mm -hmm. some shale with sands down here below in this rougher section, looking section here. But down at the bottom, you can see this one thick sandstone, uh, maybe three to four feet thick. And that's the water supply for a lot of the, lot of the area at Big Sky. It'll vary in thickness up to 10 feet or so. And uh, it's fractured sandstone. Uh, the sandstone can carry water in the pore space, but also through the fractures. And uh, that's where most of the drilling goes into these sort of, there's uh, five at least, or, or more of these uh, little sandstone lenses that supply water to wells. So taking those, uh, that bedrock into consideration, all that uh, shale and sandstone was laid down flat at one time, but through geologic mapping by other uh, geologists with the US Geologic Survey and Montana Bureau of Mines Geology, they put together a picture of what's gone on here and it's pretty dramatic. Uh, the uh, Spanish Peaks Fault initially uh, compressed this rock with faulting from the north, which, which uh, compressed all the rock north to south and folded and faulted this, all the shales and sandstones within the Big Sky area. Following that, with some faulting from the west to the east, which did the same thing, compressed and folded the rock. Andesite Mountain is a good example of a big fold where the bedrock's been, been lifted up and folded into an arch, and that forms the Andesite Mountain Ridge that you see. Following that, in mag, uh, molten uh, magma was intruded into the Lone Mountain, Pioneer Mountain, Fan Mountain, Cedar Mountain areas, which pushed up and tilted a lot of the bedrock in the area, and it all slopes and tilts away from these mountain mountains, and uh, and that adds an additional uh, complexity to the to the geology in the area. And these red lines here show different folds, and these are just the major folds and structures. There's many hundreds more that are probably uh, uh, in within this bedrock, but it's very difficult to see with uh, the uh, glacial ground cover and uh, sediments and landslide slumps and those sort of things that kind of cover and obscure some of the geology. So uh, these are the major structures, but again, there's many, many more similar to that that aren't mapped. So if you take a look from north to south, you can see that this structure on the right side pushed the bedrock up that's north of in the Gallatin Canyon, that's north of, of Big Sky and form that north ridge. It's Spanish Peaks, Spanish Peaks Fault is actually the north ridge that you see looking uh, at from Big Sky up in, into onto the mountain front there. Uh, you can see the rock was twisted and folded. And uh, this is a really generalized picture, but gives you the idea of kind of what went on with the compressional forces. All the red over here is the Lone Mountain intrusion, and this is all intruded. Uh, magmatic rock that flowed in between all the layers of the bedrock and again uh, further complicated and distorted some of the bedrock. If you look from east to west, here's Meadow Village on the right side and M Moonlight Basin on the left. I kind of did a generalized view of some of the wells that we did monitor and look at with the geology and I took one of the geologic formations that we identify and that's this gray layer that you see going through here. Uh, and you can see how this layer is tilted at Meadow Village, slopes up towards Lone Mountain, but then with the folds of Andesite Mountain and other folds in the area, you can see how this becomes kind of curved and distorted and, and crunched and compressed. And then there's a big separation and uh, then there, the formation is dipping to the west when you get over by Moonlight Basin area. And even there, you have these landslide type blocks that have slumped off the mountainside and have rotated and twisted these blocks. So now you can see there's, there's a formation laying a little flatter there and even dipping back to the east again over here. So these have all been broken into segments and chunks. And what, what makes that a difficult problem is, is that uh, if you look at a typical fault plane situation, uh, and let's just say this uh, uh, brick red color here is the aquifer you wanna get water from. If you come over here into this block, and you drill a well into that formation, you're only gonna get water over to the fault. You've now, the faulting has moved and separated this aquifer from the other part of the system. And so now you've got this small block uh, that you can draw water from. And that gives a well kind of a limited resource to draw from and, and makes it more difficult to get high volumes of water from the aquifer. Uh, and, and you can imagine if there was a fault on this side of the block, on all sides of this block, you've limit, really limited where that well, well can draw water from by looking at, at just this small space. 
and you'd have to drill another well over here to get into the uh, other part of the aquifer and to draw water from there. And that's the biggest problem at, at Big Sky right now. And if you're talking about these thin uh, sandstone lenses, that adds to the complication as well. And you can see this all over the place. You can see uh, along the road up to the base area, you can see these shales and sandstones are slightly dipping off to the east. Other areas are standing almost vertically on edge. Uh, they're dipping very steeply, so they've been faulted and displaced. And then uh, the other reason that we, we suspect these, these uh, aquifers are broken up into segments and pieces is in this example of here's three wells drilled at Moonlight Basin. These were existing and these are not pumped wells. These are just, uh, these were exploration or monitoring wells. And these are all drilled into the same sandstone formation, but you can see that each of them responds and reacts differently each year. Uh, this one only changes from, uh, uh, let's see, uh, 10, 25 uh, feet or 25 to 30 feet per year. This one's over 60 feet a year in water level change with uh, recharge from snow melt coming in and, and the water level rises and then water will drain off uh, through the year. And, and then this one down here at the bottom of the hill by the golf course, there's only less than two feet of change or maybe two and a half feet of change uh, throughout the seasonal. You see the seasonal signal each year, but the changes are very different from one another. And if these were all interconnected in the same aquifer, they would all expect to respond the same. So uh, you have quite a difference in, in water level changes there, which makes us suspect that these are broken up and segmented pieces. So the other thing we learned from groundwater uh, levels is in monitoring through the year. Uh, when I look at this well from Meadow Village Aquifer, and this is an interesting one, uh, there's uh, the gray area here is the snow water accumulation. So essentially snow accumulation through the year. And then it reaches a peak here around March, April. And then as the snow melts, the water content of the snow obviously decreases down to zero by uh, middle of June in this case. And what you can see here is as the snow reaches its peak accumulation and then begins to melt, you can see the water level in the ground starts to rise. And you see this all over Big Sky in the bedrock wells, and then in this case, in the sand and gravel of the Meadow Village Aquifer, you see the water levels rising as the snow is melting. So that means the snow is melting and infiltrating into the ground through cracks and fractures or soaking into the sands and gravels of say the Meadow Village Aquifer. And then uh, once the snow stops, though, the interesting thing, once the snow stops melting, all of a sudden there's no more recharge to the system. So through the summer, you get uh, de natural declines in the water level as, this, as the water level slowly drains out of the system uh, and there's no further recharge. There's also little, in this case, this little dip here is an indication of water pumping activity from the aquifer, from other wells. And it shows the little bit of drawdown impact but then you can see through the winter and into the next spring before snowmelt starts, the water level just continues to slowly decline as the water seeps out of the ground and actually feeds the rivers and streams in the area. And that's what maintains the stream flows through the winter is this groundwater seeping out into the system, into the river system. So the other thing that's interesting over here is, is this well was drilled next to a large pumping well for the Meadow Village Aquifer uh, water supply system. And during 2013-14, uh, uh, this well was not, this pumping well adjacent to this well was not used. But in 2015, you can see that the adjacent well was pumped. And that's what these marks are here is each time that pump cycle, it drew the aquifer water level down uh, to, a, to a lower level and then we would recover. But you can see through regular use of that, the water level draw down significant, drew down significantly and uh, dropped lower than most of the other time pre previous to that. But on the other hand, you can see that uh, the aquifer did rebound once that pumping stopped, the water level did rebound back to its more natural level and continued on its natural decline here. So, so it shows that the aquifer is resilient and did recover back to a more natural level after the pumping ceased. And you see that again in bedrock and in the sand and gravel aquifers. You get the snow melt recharging aquifers, uh, you get pumping influence from summer season and from winter season, and then you get this recovery rebound where the water level recovers back to its natural level. So that's an indication that the pumping is not seriously uh, in, impacting the aquifer, 
uh, that stress is short term and the aquifer is resilient enough to recover from that pumping impact. And uh, so it means that uh, right now there's no detrimental effect to long term losses from that aquifer. The aquifer is able to recover itself after pumping events. Uh, just another example, uh, you can see again the snow melt, the snow accumulation and the snow melt here in the gray. And you can see this well was probably heavily pumped over here on the left side. And then it slowly recovers uh, during the summer months, you can see pumping influence from nearby wells. And then here in the fall, we suspect this was probably from some pumping from a number of wells in the area that drew down the water level very, very deeply. And then by then, once again, once that pumping stopped, it recovered back to a natural level and continued on. So again, even with high stresses, there was not a lot of uh, problem with uh, water level recovery. And just to show you here, the stream levels kind of follow the mimic the, uh, the same patterns as the groundwater levels do, first because they're getting snow melt, but also because of the drainage and runoff from the groundwater system. The only other, the other thing we looked at was uh, groundwater vulnerability to contamination. And one thing we looked at was nitrate concentrations. And uh, the drinking water standard is 10 milligrams per liter nitrate in water. And we saw none of that, uh, no exceedances anywhere in any sort of chemistry. The chemistry of the water in Big Sky overall is very good. Uh, one thing we did notice was that there's an elevated concentration of, of nitrates in the Meadow Village aquifer, sand and gravel here. Uh, but you can see the other areas are all less than two milligrams per liter. Uh, and so these were, were up to seven was the highest we saw. There are also a couple springs that drain from the Meadow Village Aquifer and they drain into the Middle Fork and the South Fork rivers. And again, they had uh, elevated concentrations of nitrate in them as well. So what's all this mean? Uh, the aquifers from uh, drawing, most of the big sky is drawing from thin sandstones that are broken and segmented, uh, but the groundwater and the groundwater recharge is seasonal and it's strictly from snow melt. And snow melt's a great benefit to the aquifers because they recharge each year to back to a level of previous years. Uh, uh, right now, pumping, there was no indication of pumping harming the aquifer longevity or, uh, or usefulness. Uh, so right now, the aquifers are able to maintain and supply the water needs of the community. Uh, groundwater supports surface water flow during the winter months. And they're all groundwater and surface water are all interconnected. So what happens to one may happen, maybe affect the other one. Uh, again, groundwater is vulnerable to contamination as is surface water. And what happens to one can possibly happen to both. So uh, that uh, pretty much sums up kind of my short version of, of what we learned. Um, and I also want to mention that coming soon will be a pamphlet with a brief description of, of some of this too to summarize for general public's use and uh, Gallatin River Task Force and the Bureau are working on getting that out this fall and still so uh, that will be available to the general public for distribution around the area hopefully it's helpful. James, uh, James Rose, thank you very much that was a that was a great overview and I think it um, gives us some background into uh, the rest of our conversation. Um, you know Jim Muscat uh, Let's, let's put that in, in context a bit. You know, it's been reported in local media that the Big Sky County Water and Sewer District officials believe Big Sky's water demand will outpace supply in Meadow Village by 2032. Um, I'd like to ask you, you know, what does this mean for the district and will the new water resource recovery facility that's under construction have any impact on water supply? Uh, thanks, Joe, and, and, and thanks, James, for you know, a great overview of that. And um, I think um, before I get into too much, I think it's really some things for everybody to understand is, you know, what, what the question is, how is this affecting the Big Sky Water and Sewer District? Well, it's important to know there are multiple public water systems within Big Sky. Now, if this was the town of Bozeman, it'd be, you know, how does Bozeman's water? But we are as everybody knows, a little different up here and that we're, we're multiple districts. So my responses are, how does this affect our particular district and the YC, the Spanish Peaks, uh, Moonlight, all those water systems are faced with the same challenges and trying to live within their means with their water supply too. And that's, that's really where I'm going with this. And, uh, but it's important to realize there are multiple, multiple water systems up here. What we're doing, what we've always done is 
you know, when Big Sky started, you had Original Mountain and Meadow Village, and that was all that was supposed to be there. There was well drilled to satisfy that ultimate demand. Well, we've obviously grown a lot more, Town Center, West Fork, South Fork, you know, all these other communities. So the demand that Big Sky, that everything falls under that heading, and in this case, Big Sky Water and Sewer, is, is kind of a moving carrot at the end of the stick. So final build out is, 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 moved, is moved in front of us. But what we do to stay ahead of it, and we just completed another update is a, what they call a source water capacity plan. And that takes, and looks at a snapshot in time. We just did this recently, our growth, our expansion versus our water use. And that's where the number that you, uh, that you referred to Joe in the, in the question, that shows us that we're, you know, we're heading toward the point where we need to add supply. And we're well aware of this and this has incrementally happened over the last few decades. Um, about, I'm gonna guess about seven years ago, we added a couple big mel, uh, wells in the meadow, uh, boosted, our, boosted our capacity there because we have more, back then anyways, we had a lot more growth in the meadow. We probably still do, but we have, we have really two, two sides to our water system. We have the mountain and the meadow. And by meadow, I'm kind of generously qualifying all everything down below here, but there's a lot of irrigation down here. There's not so much on the mountain. Irrigation is the wild card in water use. Um, our irrigation, our summer use, when there's probably less tourists here, arguably than in the peak of the snow summer season, our water use is 300 to 600% more in the summertime than in the, than the wintertime. So it's irrigation, that's, but that's what we have to plan for. We can't plan for average, we have to plan for worst case scenario. It's not acceptable to run out of water just a couple of weeks a year. We've got to keep, them, keep it going all the time. So what we do is we, we, we updated our source water capacity plan. There will need, be a need to add supply if we want to continue to grow at this pace. But bottom line, I think, uh, you know, we're not gonna run out of water, but what may happen ultimately someday, and certainly I don't think by 2038 is Big Sky is gonna have to have a conversation with itself is how big do we grow here? How big can we grow? Every mm -hmm. restaurant, every theater, and every water system has a seating capacity. And we've got to, you know, constantly try to figure out where that is and build to it. And there, there's so many, as you know, other factors involved in, in, in the growth area here, but water can only take us so far. Uh, most of the press, and I've said this for years, working for the Big Sky Water and Sewer, most of the press has been on the, the wastewater and the discharge of it and all the political ramifications, environmental and all that, and they're all very important subjects, but the true limiting factor is probably gonna be mother nature and how much water is here. And James done a great job of kind of a, an overview of just how complicated it is. And, and uh, one thing I think we could probably all agree on is there is a limit to it. There, there, there definitely is a limit to it. So we're, we're keeping the, you know, things rolling along here with what we have and adding supply. Um, that kind of rolls into, you know, uh, the, two, the two things, like I say, that, uh, that will drive uh, drive that. One we control, we can control one we can't. The one we can't control is what I've mentioned, Mother Nature and how much water is there. What we can we, we can control is how we conserve what we have and, and, and how we how we deal with that. And um, we can have a lot of control over that. Um, one one tool in that toolbox may be in the future, getting back to your question, Joe, is the new water resource facility, basically the new treatment plant will bring us the technology to treat our wastewater to the point we can actually re-inject it, direct potable reuse, re-inject it back in the groundwater and recycle it. So that in essence will buy us more growth, buy us more time, however you wanna look at it. That, that's how that question relates to it. Um, you know, there's the whole issue of water rights and all that, but for this conversation, that's not really important. We have plenty of water rights, but that doesn't mean there's plenty of water. So there's a finite amount of water and the Big Sky Water and Sewer District, as I'm, you know, YC works on it hard, Spanish Peaks, all the water systems do is try to make what we have go as far as we can. And that's what we're doing. And there's probably going to be some, some social adjustment going on just the way there is right now in living color in Las Vegas and Los Angeles. Look at Lake Mead, look at Lake Powell. You've all heard about it. That's, that's what we're, we're getting a glimpse into the future, you know. So... 
Yeah. Um, it's not a crisis and it's not going to sneak up on us. It's going to be a conversation we have over and over again. And, and the good news is there's regulatory tools in, in place to keep a town from outgrowing its own water resource, short of some catastrophic event that nobody saw coming. You know, all developments have to go through DEQ review. Is there enough water? Is there enough sewer? All those things are in place and those will continue to be in place. So, um, mm -hmm. It's going to happen, you know, whether it's in our lifetime or not, that eventually uh, we run out. Maybe it's going to be sooner as opposed to later. I can't really tell you that. But, um, you know, James did a great job of showing how our the aquifers we do have, we draw off. In theory, they do replenish every year. Will that continue at what rate? We don't know. Um, but uh, there is some low hanging fruit in conservation that we can all get in on. Um, and I've been preaching this for almost 30 years. And when well, when I first came to Big Sky a long time ago, the BSOA, and they did this for a long time, hopefully they're still not doing it, actually required people to put in a minimum amount of sod, grass, and lawn. And that mm -hmm. just showed at the time the, the lack of understanding that the, the, the amount of water we have here was finite, you know. Um, they've come around and everybody's come around. And I think if you if you ever been to Phoenix, Arizona, you're going to get a glimpse of what's going to happen in the future. People have rock lawns and all these no maintenance things. And it's just a, it's a natural reaction. And yeah. if, if we want to continue to grow, um, I think what's important for a lot of the residents that maybe don't study on this, I don't, I'm pretty confident I can say you're, you're, if you're, if you already live here and you have a house, your tap is always going to have water in it. It's really not about losing the water we already have. It's how much more can we grow? And that's, yeah. that's really the question we're faced with. And some people that might be a good thing that we can't grow anymore or some people that want to. So depending on what your perspective on it, but uh, sure. this water sewer district and all the, uh, the other water sewer districts uh, in the area are aware of this and keeping an eye on it. And in conjunction with state regulatory agencies, we're trying to not outgrow our supply. It's that simple. Sure. sure. Thank you, Jim. That's, that's great. And I appreciate you touching on the recycle component of the potential for the water uh, resource facility, especially, you know, in the face of, you know, what, what James um, mentioned in his overview of snowmelt being, you know, the main water source in Big Sky. I think in the face of, of climate change, we're going to have to be asking ourselves these, these uh, difficult questions. So thank, anyway, thank you for that. Um, yeah. I'd like to jump over to, to you, Mace uh, Mangold and, and Scott Altman. I think we'll start with Mace here, but uh, if you could give us a brief rundown of what um, Gallatin Canyon Water and Sewer District is and uh, and and oh boy, um, what it, you know what it is and and uh, what the future holds for the district. Yeah, I think I've got it to where everybody can see my screen, which is the Canyon District website. Does that show up all right? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Uh, so the Canyon Sewer District was formed at the end of 2020. So uh, as a result of a, a one-year study facilitated by the Gallatin River Task Force, funded by BizRAD, um, it really looked at the feasibility of central sewer collection tied to the fact that the entire canyon area, that you can see kind of scrolling in this picture, is well and septic based. So each one of these homes has either their own septic or there's community septics and those septics ultimately discharge into the aquifer that we've been talking about as one of our primary water supplies. So I don't want to get long winded, but in essence, the Canyon district functions as a mechanism to provide that central infrastructure, tap public funds that make improve the affordability of constructing this infrastructure because it, it isn't cheap. It, it takes a, a good amount of money to collect three to five miles of septic systems. And the current plan of attack is to convey that, that collected sewer up to Big Sky's new treatment plant, treat it to a really high quality effluent, and then come back down and use it as aquifer recharge. So again, I encourage you to visit the, the Canyon's website. It has a full overview of the project, the benefits, uh, the funding received to date and the timeline. So I'll, I'll keep it brief and point you to the website for more information. Yeah, thanks, Mace. Uh, and just just a quick follow up on that. Will that will that 
potentially handle all of the septic systems in the canyon? So our, our latest study and effort was really trying to prioritize on a per dollar basis, what should be our focus areas? Where, where are the bulk of the septic systems and where do those septic systems pose the most risk to the river and to down gradient well, well, private wells, drinking water sources. Um, so the goal is to get as many septics as we can um, and protect the aquifer and the river to the maximum extent affordable. Um, the odds of collecting the entire canyon area, it's pretty low. Once you get into that lower density off mm. the valley bottom, um, it's just not cost effective. And, and frankly, the risk of contamination and impact to the river starts to go down as you get further from the river. So it's kind of a, a cost benefit aspect to that question. Got it. Thank you, Mace. Um, Scott Altman, welcome. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, Scott, Thank you, you are. Yeah, thanks. Um, your board chair for the Gallatin Canyon Water and Sewer District. I'm going to follow up with that question to Mace with you uh, here. Does the canyon intend to supply water in addition to treatment of effluent? So I think our goal, um, first of all, it's been an amazing collaboration between the task force, the BizRAD, um, Big Sky Water and Sewer, um, everyone's kind of really been on board. I mean, if we look at what what we've done in a, in a short period of time, it's super encouraging. And our partnership with Mace and his company has been amazing. They have gone out and gotten us um, grants and such just at, just at a great rate. It's been super exciting. Um, but our, our pretty much our goal is, like, like Mace said, we want to take as many people off offline as possible as far as old septic tanks, anything that can be a danger to the river, pretty much everything that we can afford to service, we want to take, we want to take whatever's going in there now. And, and if we, and if we were, we get rid of the bad and we replace it with stuff that's much more highly treated. So in order to do that, kind of with what Mace was saying, we went through a, um, we went through a whole study to find out what's the most critical. Well, you know, getting those, everyone knows, tanks off the line is, is critical, but also also that the people have on that side following the natural gradient towards the river are a human health health risk as well. So if it, nothing else, we feel like we can, with some annexations, we feel like we can get some water. Um, there's still a lot of studies to, to prove that, but we feel like we can get some water. And our initial goal would be to take off offline all those wells on the river side of 191. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question, yes, we feel like we can get water. We feel like it's critical to get at least enough water to take those guys off and put those guys on, um, on water and, um, and help the health risk over there. Um, and if we get more, that's great. We'll, we'll try and keep making progress with those things. But right now, I think the, the, the goal is find out how much water we can get and then see the best, the highest money to reward ratio we can do um, with, that, with that water to, to, to help the canyon the most, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It does. Well, thanks, Scott. That, that's great. And, you know, it's such a ma massive project um, that this collaborative group is undertaking. So I just, you know, I think everyone really appreciates the efforts. Uh, Kristen well, thank Gardner. you very much. It's been, it's been yeah. great. Thank you, Kristen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kristen, thanks for your patience. Um, nice to see you as well. How, uh, let me, let me jump over to you. How is Gallon River Task Force uh, working um, with both water and sewer districts and Big Sky on water supply on, um, you know, on, on the, the work that they're doing. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Resort Tax and Big Sky Chamber for hosting this panel. Um, so we've had a longstanding history of working with the Big Sky Water and Sewer District that uh, really started with our water conservation program. That was born out of a 2015 effort that we worked on that was essentially a pilot program to assess building drought resilience at the watershed scale. And we hosted a bunch of drought resilience workshops and water and sewer district was part of that. And 
from that, we started the second water conservation program in the state of Montana that was modeled after Bozeman's program that focused on education and outreach and providing financial incentives. Uh, the Water and Sewer District helped fund this program as well as share data. And they've, all, they've also helped get the word out to their constituents through mailings and through their website on the various uh, financial incentives that we uh, promote through this program. Um, in 2018, we also worked with the Water and Sewer District and update an ordinance that added landscaping recommendations. And then um, more recently, the Water and Sewer District has provided data that informed our updated water conservation and drought management plan. And we've just completed that this fall. And so we're re really excited to implement this plan and strengthen our partnership with the Water and Sewer, Di Sewer District and the other water providers in Big Sky, um, you know, because one of the big outcomes of this source water capacity plan that Jim mentioned is a um, priority on water conservation. And it is important to note, Jim also mentioned this, that the Water and Sewer dis District only serves about 60% of our community. So the rest of our community is serviced by other public providers as well as individual wells. So one of our key focus areas coming out of this new planning effort is to figure out a partnership model where we can all work together to make sure that the entire community is working on proactively on water conservation efforts. Water is a shared public resource and how it's managed by one entity or landowner will impact and ultimately, um, it'll ultimately impact the water that is um, shows up in the river and our streams. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, we've also collaborated with the Water and Sewer District on the proposals that led to the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology studies, the one that James mentioned in Big Sky, and then also the one that, um, that he's working on currently in Gallatin Canyon. And then as far as the Gallatin Canyon Water and Sewer District, we haven't worked with them specifically on water supply issues yet, but look forward to in the future as they um, try to figure out what that looks like. Got it. Thank you, Kristen. Appreciate, appreciate that. And um, yeah, I know, I know you guys have got a lot of initiatives going on and, and you know, congrats on, on those efforts. Uh, Rich Chandler, welcome to you. Let me jump over to you quickly. Uh, what is the status of the Yellowstone Club's uh, snowmaking initiative currently? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, David, and everyone for having us here. I think the panelists uh, started hitting a little bit of a chord here, which is, uh, you know, how can we start looking at recycling hmm. opportunities with the water, especially with the water that's been, you know, put through the treatment plants. And I think the YC project is a good illustration of that. Um, this started back in 2011 with the seed that was planted within the community of how to uh, create more storage in our aquifer and, and create more opportunity. And snowmaking was one of the options that really jumped out at all of us moving. Moving from 2011 to 18, we, we initiated the permitting process and it was you know a three-year process. We do have all the permits in place. Uh, we, we began that construction effort here last July, and uh, we have uh, on track to put in about 70% of the infrastructure here between that July timeframe and, and November 1, when we're gonna shut the project down. Um, we're really looking forward to starting the system up here this fall, <clears throat> but unfortunately some uh, constraints specifically with some electrical distribution equipment has really prevented us from getting the entire system up and running so it's looking as though it's going to be a 2023 startup for us. Uh, we do have all the deep utilities in the ground, you know, all the main conduits for water and such. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're, we're unable to turn the system on until uh, fall of next year. Got it. Um, you know, I was just going to follow up with that. You know, will this project uh, have any impact on water supply? I mean, could it, I mean, potentially help recharge the aquifer, for example? Well, I think most certainly that's one of the biggest drivers to the community's involvement with this project. You know, we're, the first phase of the YC project is to put 25 million gallons of, of water out in the form of snow up on the ski hill. And the return of that generally is modeled somewhere between 70 and 80 percent. You know, a lot of that is lost in the atmosphere. So if you're looking at 17 to 20 million gallons recharged to the aquifer, it's a significant amount 
especially for it just being the first phase of the project. You know, there's concepts on the table for YC to develop more and maybe some of the other neighboring ski areas as well. You know, not, not putting that water solely out for irrigation where the plants totally take it up, but, but maybe uh, reinventing this a little bit, taking the snow and, and storing it so it is a recharge instead of just an agronomic uptake um, sure. isn't just an immediate result for snow making and not pulling the water out of the aquifer, but it also allows that storage component to prevent, you know, to provide more long stream um, infusion of water throughout the season. Got it. Got it. Thanks, Rich. Yeah, it's a massive project and uh, we'll look forward to seeing how that rolls out, you know, you know next yeah, I year. Think the, I think the team put down 37,000 linear feet of pipe this summer. Wow. Which is remarkable for such a short period of time. It certainly is. Yeah. Nice work. Well, um, I've got I've got one more quick question before we jump to some audience questions. Kristen, I want to I want to head back to you here. Um, you know, there's been some a lot of talk about algae blooms in the Gallatin, you know, obviously nitrogen. Well, and James Rose talked about nitrate levels, but, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus are nutrients that have been linked to increase algae blooms um, in the Gallatin. What are some of the factors causing higher amounts of these nutrients? I think you're on mute there. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, we haven't actually recorded higher levels of the nutrients in the stream. Mm -hmm. uh, we, but we have seen, seen changing environmental conditions like warming water temperatures and more sunlight. Um, we also, we, we have conducted these experiments in the river that do show that if we, have more, if we do add more nitrogen to the stream that we will see more algae. So really we're really focused on reducing the amount of, of nutrient, of nitrogen, excuse me, that makes it to the stream. Um, and so sources of nitrogen include, you know, wastewater, both from centralized treatment and septic systems, also fertilizer, stormwater. Um, but, you know, with the new treatment plant, that will definitely help reduce the amount of nitrogen that makes it to the river. But there's still those septic systems, not only in Gallatin Canyon, but mm. also in the meadow um, that we need to hook up to centralized treatment if we really want to um, do the most that we can to lessen those future algae blooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just you know mentioned the the um, water resource recovery facility. You know, will that higher level of treatment rid us of algae blooms in the Gallatin, and, and would it have any impact on on water supply? Uh, I don't think it'll rid us of future algae blooms. Algae blooms, like I said, I think we have to address the septic systems to um, really do the job, but. Um, as far as water supply, it will greatly benefit water supply um, if we choose water reuse or wastewater reuse options that benefit water supply. And also if we strategi strategically release that water in areas that will replenish that where the water is being withdrawn. So for example, if we're withdrawing water from Meadow Village, we need to focus on reuse um, that is benefiting the meadow village area essentially. So yeah, that, that um, improvement in the plant will allow us to do um, those options that, that benefit water supply like groundwater recharge and like the snowmaking project at uh, the Yellowstone Club that Rich mentioned. Mm -hmm. Got it, well that's, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how this all goes. I mean, this will be a discussion for, for a very long time, uh, but I think this has been incredibly helpful uh, for for everyone to help get a better understanding from a lot of your um, knowledgeable perspectives, uh, you know, Jenny, I wanted to go over to you. Do we have any questions from the audience? We have a few. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start with one for James Rose. What years were the was the data and analysis that he presented regarding the water wells, et cetera, collected? This person thought they saw two thousand sixteen. Um, but just wants to clarify. Right, yeah, the data were, were collected 2013, 14, 15, and a little bit in 16, but essentially that time period, uh, and the report uh, took a little bit longer to write because it was an extensive area, but uh, 
but that's the period the data were collected. And uh, one thing about it, if there's concern about it being the situation being different now would be uh, we have all that baseline data now for a lot of these wells and a lot of the groundwater systems and streams in the area. And uh, we could always go back and revisit some of these areas and see if anything's changed based on, you know, but, but from that three year period that we saw, uh, things were pretty consistent year to year within a little bit of variation for different uh, pre precipitation amounts and, and that sort of thing. May I just add one thing? Um, that the, the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology is continuing to monitor some of those wells as well as the Water and Sewer District. And one of the outcomes of the, the source water capacity plan that that Jim mentioned is recommending that they put more um, lot data loggers into, into more wells in the mm -hmm. Meadow Village. Nice. Uh, this question's for Jim. You spoke on irrigation as a big influence in usage. Other than updated landscape plans with minimal irrigation, what are other best practices that you would recommend to keep residential water usage low? I know that the Water and Sewer District has been working hard to alert customers about leaks and running appliances. Hmm. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, well, this was a big part, as I mentioned, in our source capacity plan. And our engineer actually kind of recommended what was dubbed some draconian measures. And that was basically limiting all landscape, all new landscape. To 500 square feet and if you think about that that's not a very big lawn but that would that would put some teeth into it that would have an effect on it every little bit helps but at this point in the equation we're looking at the what i call the low-hanging fruit the big gains um obviously it's a it's a it's a mind change it's a mindset it's a you know a demographic change from when we all grew up in sprinklers and lawns and big lawns and all that so it is it is it will be a gradual change but uh the biggest thing we can do is is changing landscape to zero scape that is that is two-thirds to three-quarters of it right there because when you look at the flow data from big sky itself and you compare it on a nationwide basis and this is kind of what i use as a barometer is the deq kind of figures 300 gallons per day per household. And that's domestic use. Well, Big Sky is quite a bit less of that in the wintertime when you take the landscape body equation. So as a community, we're pretty conservative in water. And part of that is on the demographics of resorts. People are coming here It's it's versus, I'll use the, the term, a, a working town where it's a bedroom community. Belgrave would be a good example. People go to work and they come home. There's not that much uh, VRBO going on and that type of stuff. So our population uh, structure is kind of such that people aren't staying home very much. They're they're coming here and using the the uh, resources around. So on a per day per gallon per day per person, we're actually quite good. But we just really go off the map with the irrigation. So that's that's where we need to. That's where we are and where we really need to put focus. And we will just need to put more and more teeth into that. We have tools. Uh, Ron Edwards will, will remind me all the time that you know we do control the water rates, and that is the obvious big hammer. You can make it so expensive, but on the other hand, there's there's you know that's not as effective a tool in a town like this as maybe some other towns. But um, irrigation and water conservation is is the bulk of the conversation. Mm, thanks, Jim. I, I, Jenny, I think we probably have uh, time for one more. One more question if you've got one. Okay, perfect. Bill Reed, um, you have your hand raised. If you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, we can we should be able to hear you. Bill, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, we're gonna move on to Tally. Tally, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, Tally, we got you. Mm. How about now? Hey, there, there you are. There you are. Okay, terrific. Hey, um, I guess this is a question for Jim. As you talk about conservation, I wonder if another low-hanging fruit isn't 
addressing the law that requires hot tubs to be completely emptied after every renter um, mm -hmm. stays in a unit. That seems to be, to, to my mind, a, a, a low hanging fruit, but maybe it's not. Um, I couldn't agree more. It, it you know, I, I was surprised to see her here. Uh, we've got a new employee on the sewer side here, Adam Roots, and he was in that business. And that's what I just, you know, about a year ago came to realize how much these hot tubs turn over. It's a big factor. Now, the district can only do so much of that because um, you have to realize these people are paying for the water. It's going through the meter. We can only... Uh, you know, we can only interfere to some to some extent. That, that is certainly a lot of water. But on a scale, when you take that two to three hundred gallons of water, even per day, let's just say they did it three hundred sixty five days a year, which they don't. It's a drop in the bucket still compared to the irrigation. When you start doing the math on irrigation um, and the amount of gallons per day that puts out, usually morning and evening, it's it's still uh, it's still not of the same scale. But every 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 little bit helps, and and hot tubs aren't a little bit. But I'm not sure what the answer is there, especially on the uh, post COVID and the awareness and all that kind of thing. That's why they're doing it. So we're aware of it. We uh, we don't uh, you know have any plans immediately start controlling or stopping that. But uh, it all goes to the demographics and the, and the attitude. We all have to kind of reevaluate how much we use if uh, if we want to continue this lifestyle here. Mm. Thanks, Tally. Great question, uh, Jim. Great, great answer as well. I mean, I think what this goes to show is that, you know, the communication, the conversation is ongoing, but that we're talking about it at all is, is, a, is, a, is a major component. Um, yeah, what, a, what an educational discussion. Uh, you know, thank all of you for uh, who are watching and a, a big thanks to all our panelists. Uh, I'm Joe O'Connor, Managing Editor with uh, Mountain Journal. And this conversation on our local water supply has been part of the Big Sky Community Week hosted by uh, Big Sky Resort Area District and the Big Sky Chamber of Commerce. Uh, check this week's event schedule and watch the full recording of this conversation, uh, which will be available tomorrow morning at BigSkyCommunityWeek.com. Uh, last, lastly, you know, join us uh, at 2 p.m. today. I'll be hosting another panel discussion uh, on emergency management in Big Sky. And again, thanks everyone for your time. Uh, great conversation and have a, a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, guys. everyone.